Hey, my name is Joel. Thank you for checking out this video. In this video, yes, it's still recording. This video is part three in a series that I'm doing on drum physics. That sounds very heady and knowledgeable, drum physics. But I'm basically just talking about the features or the characteristics, the variables that affect the way a drum sounds. I'm tackling them more or less individually with each video, but they all interact to create the sound of various types of drums. If you're interested in why drums sound the way they do, I think you'll find it very useful. This is all stuff that I have been exposed to and or discovered and noticed just over the last 30 plus years of recording drums, 40 plus years of playing drums. In the first video, I talked about mass and the effect that mass has on the sound of a drum. So a drum shell that has greater mass versus a drum shell that has less mass and how, with all other factors being equal, how that's going to affect the drum sound. The second video, I talked about bearing edges. Bearing edges is a very popular topic. People have very strong opinions. I tried to kind of dumb it down and just really break it down to the basics that you really need to know because you can really drive yourself nuts thinking about all the possible variables, most of which are fairly minute, the differences. And it's really just a couple of major things you need to be aware of. I discussed that in that video. Both of those videos I will link to below. So check those out if you have not and are interested. In this video, I'm gonna talk about plastic drum wrap. That seems like probably a rather interesting thing to discuss when talking about the design of a drum because do people, when designing a drum, think about plastic wrap? Or are they thinking about edges and the, the tone wood that they're using, how many plies and the hardware and on and on. Drum wrap has a really dramatic impact on the performance of a drum. But before I get too into that, I'm gonna read through some an outline here, some notes that I've jotted to keep myself on target as I've done in the previous couple of videos. So let's go ahead and get started with this. First of all, why plastic drum wrap? Why have we ever wrapped drums in plastic? When did we start doing that and why? What's the purpose? Well, plastic wrap finishes were introduced in the 1920s and 30s as a premium feature of top of the line drums. Plastic wrap was desirable from a manufacturing standpoint because one, it was novel. It hadn't been used before. Plastic is a petroleum product. And I don't know when plastic was invented. There's lots of different types. I imagine probably sometime in the latter part of the 19th century is when we first created plastic, but it started getting used on a larger level in the 20th century. It's really kind of a 20th century thing. So it was introduced in the 20s and 30s as a finish for drum manufacturers. It was novel. It provided an easy way to apply an attractive, attention-getting finish, the pearls, the sparkles, etc., that couldn't be accomplished with paint. The plastic finishes that were available when they started using them, allowed aesthetics that you really couldn't get with paint. They were painting drums, but typically they were just like as black or white or just some solid color. They do a duco finish or something. But when you painted drums back then, if you look at the old drums then, they aren't shiny, polished, deep, modern style, glossy, rich, you know, finishes that have been applied layer after layer of clear coat and all that kind of stuff. They were more or less just sprayed down to cover the color of the grain and get the drum out the door. So having a plastic finish that you could fairly easily and quickly just glue onto the shell and get the drum out the door while still providing vibrant colors and then the three dimensional effect, you know, sparkles as you look at it from different angles, it moves and it shines differently and the pearls, it's deep, it's rich, it's bright, it's really attractive and it was novel. It was something people had not seen at the time. So it was very, very popular and anything that's really popular, supply and demand, you know, it's gonna be more expensive. It was also durable and it required only occasional wipe down with a soft, damp cloth to quote a 1932 Ludwig and Ludwig catalog to keep it clean. And it gave companies an opportunity to create unique finishes for their drums. Throughout the 20th century, many drum manufacturers created their own finishes. Everyone kind of had your green and orange and silver sparkle and your white marine pearl and black diamond pearl. They had different names for those things, but they were all variants of that kind of a thing. But then you also had your top hat and cane, which is admittedly very rare. They didn't make a lot of those. But, you know, Slingerland had peacock pearl, I think, or maybe Ludwig and Ludwig did early on. But Rogers, you know, in the 60s, they had their onyx finishes. So if you saw those, you pretty much knew you were looking at a Rogers drum. Slingerland had various satin flames, I think they called them, in the 60s and 70s. And so many of these unique finishes 
sort of established each manufacturer, kind of set them apart from one another. So much so that, in fact, in the early 60s when Ringo Starr went to Drum City and visited Ivor Arbiter to get a deal on a new drum set, he saw a swatch of Black Oyster Pearl and said, I want a premier drum set in that finish. And Ivor Arbiter, being the Ludwig importer for the UK at the time, said, you can't get that in Premier because that's a Ludwig finish. And he said, okay, give me a Ludwig kit in that finish. And to my knowledge, that's basically how Ringo chose Ludwig drums. It wasn't like, oh, I want a Ludwig kit. Now I have a chance to get a Ludwig kit. The other Beatles may have been wanting American guitars, Fenders and Gibsons and stuff, but Ringo just wanted Black Oyster Pearl. That was cool looking, give me that finish. So he wound up with Ludwig. That was a Ludwig finish. Other companies didn't have that. So it gave companies an opportunity through their plastic wraps to develop a different aesthetic and to set their products apart from their competitions. Throughout most of the 20th century, plastic wrap finishes were used for more expensive drums, while lower cost entry-level and mid-level drums were often only available with lacquer finishes. This was true of most all well-known American makes, Slayerland, Ludwig, Rogers, Gretsch, Leedy, Camco, all the big names that you're familiar with in America. And I say America or the United States really because the drum set is kind of one of those uniquely American inventions. It, of course, jazz music spread all over the world and now you know drums are made all over the world and used all over the world. But as jazz was really coming into its own in the early 20th century, and people were going from a bass drum and a snare drum to you know sock cymbals and using a little china cymbal here and there and some other cymbals for different effects, splash, things like that, temple blocks and timpani, and you'd see all these crazy setups that eventually coalesced and kind of became the modern drum set uh, as the as the jazz era sort of progressed through swing and big band and then getting into more combo trio type stuff and the drum set continued to evolve so it's kind of a uniquely american thing and the american drum companies really kind of set the pace for the technology of drums including plastic wrap and that's why i mentioned the american makes here all the classic drums of value in the vintage drum market, the Gretsch round badges, the Slingerland Radio Kings, Covington era Rogers drums, 1960s Ludwig three ply classic and club date drums, etc., were, and still are, if in original collectible condition, wrapped with a plastic finish. Now, some of those, like the Ludwig club date, that was available with a painted Duco finish as a cost-saving measure. Same shell, same everything else, just wasn't wrapped in plastic. In fact, I've got a shot of a 1967 Ludwig catalog here. This kit called the New Yorker, the Ludwig New Yorker, or the Ludwig Traveler. These are three-piece drum kits. It's a 2012 bass drum, or on the right, it's a 2213 bass drum tom combination. Both have superphonic snares, but they're smaller kits, and that's the cost-saving feature. Because they were meant to be cost-saving, if you look down here, you can get a choice of lacquer finish with Peisty Symbols for $507, or you can get a choice of pearl finish for $544, so it's a $37 difference. Again, this is 1967. So you have a $37 difference for a bass drum and a tom, either painted or covered in a pearl finish. That amounts to $330 in today's money. So $330 to get a pearl wrapped finish on a bass drum and a tom, instead of just getting them solid paint or, you know, just sprayed clear coat or a Duco finish or whatever. And this continued into the early 70s also with most manufacturers. Some manufacturers by the 60s, 70s, it was like they offered some natural finishes and it was the same price. But the vast majority of the drums that people were using and playing and collecting today were still wrapped in plastic. So my question is, do they sound bad? Does this like a Gretsch round badge kit in blue sparkle sound bad? I've never heard people griping about the sound of their vintage drums that they paid an arm and a leg for. The first time that I heard the claim that plastic drum wrap had a detrimental effect on the drum's tone was in the mid to late 1980s when learning that DW only did lacquer or oil rubbed finishes and they refused at that time to wrap their drums in plastic because it inhibited the shell's ability to vibrate. So this was interesting because this was probably late 80s, 86, 87, somewhere around there that I started kind of becoming more aware of DW drums, not just the pedals and things that they were known for earlier in the decade, but DW drums. I remember turning on MTV and seeing Ricky Rocket playing with Poison with this green and black, I think it was, DW kit and going, oh, he's playing DW drums. Like that was the first time I saw like sort of a big player playing DW. Of course, they went on to 
to dominate the drum market in later years, but that was fairly new. And they were only doing painted finishes at the time. They were not going to wrap their drums in plastic. Now, eventually, market forces did prevail, and there were enough people who really wanted Marine Pearl, or they wanted their sparkle finish, or they, they wanted something. So DW acquiesced and made those finishes available in what they called finish ply, which you can argue the merits of the technique of applying the finish, but basically they're still gluing a plastic finish to the shell. It's interesting to hear for the first time someone saying that plastic keeps the drum shell from vibrating because that kind of worked nicely with what Tama had been saying for a couple of years at that point when they introduced in 1983 their thinner shelled Art Star line, which strangely enough was only very deep dimensions, which were popular at the time. But it still was the thinner shell. I think it was like a four-ply shell instead of the six-ply shell. And Tama got that idea from Neil Peart, who had, in 1981, been sitting on his thumbs in the studio while their live album, Exit Stage Left, was being edited and mixed, and he just didn't have much to do. So he was kicking around the studio, found an old Heyman drum kit, which is an English brand from the 60s and 70s. He was probably a 10-year-old kid or so at the time, needed some TLC. So he took it apart, cleaned everything up, polished, put new heads on, the same kind of heads he was using on his Thomas Superstar kit. And he loved the sound of them. He thought they were more vibrant, more alive. And he contacted Thomas, and they decided to basically take that idea and make a custom kit for him. They made a four-ply kit instead of a six-ply kit, still using birch, but they used reinforcing rings, which Superstar Drums did not have. They went ahead and put the reinforcing rings in, and I don't know how much they stuck to the Heyman formula, because the Heyman formula was four plies of, of shell and then eight plies for the reinforcing rings, which was you know twice as much ring as shell. And then the inside of the shell, they actually put seven coats of what they called a metallic polyurethane, or a metallized polyurethane, or something that was meant to completely seal off the grain of the wood entirely so that the wood would not absorb any sound from the drum. They called them vibrosonic shells, and that's what Neil would have been playing when he did that Heyman kit. And it's interesting, the vibrosonic shells, because Neil's drums at that point were vibrofibed, you can look that up, vibrofibing. Uh, in fact, maybe I'll, if I can find a link, I'll stick a link to that. But it's basically applying a coat of fiberglass basically inside the drum to seal off the wood and to do kind of sort of what the Heyman drum idea did. But they used polyurethane and versus the vibrofibing, which was done by the drum center of Fort Wayne, Indiana, or something like that. I forget the name of the place. So the idea of a thinner shell that had a more brightness to it, coupled with we're also not going to burden the shell with a lot of weight, you know, from plastic glued to it. We're going to let it vibrate freely. Those kind of went together. Again, a few years earlier, as I showed you in the first video, I had learned that Sonar's idea behind the shell was that it should be passive. And these approaches were making the shell an active part of the drum sound, which has continued up to this day. So it's a very common thing today. At the time, it was kind of groundbreaking to be pointed out the idea of letting the shell vibrate. So let's get away from the subjective and talk more objectively now. How does the drum wrap impact the sound of a drum? Well, firstly, it adds mass. Wrap has mass. Adding it to a shell increases the mass of the shell. Secondly, it potentially insulates the shell, providing a type of shock absorption through the method used to adhere it to the shell. If the insulating layer of adhesive is softer, than the tone wood used to construct the shell, it will not only absorb energy from the shell, but it can actually stifle the drumhead vibrations or the sustain, even though one would expect the added mass of the wrap to increase the sustain. So if you go back to the first video, I talk about mass. And one of the realities of greater mass on the shell is you get greater sustain from the head, all other things being equal and a stronger fundamental tone. Whereas here, adding mass through gluing a wrap to the shell doesn't necessarily increase the sustain. And the reason is because the glue itself, many glues, aren't very hard when they're dried or cured. They might be softer than the tone would. And so you could, by insulating the shell with a rubberized adhesive, basically, shorten the sustain of the drum. You know, if you pick up a drum shell, it's mounted on an isolation mount or something. If you hit it, it's got a certain amount of sustain. And then you put your fingers on it and you hold it or your hands and then strike it again. And it's gonna sound pretty different. It's gonna have a stronger fundamental. And depending upon how much transfer of energy from the heads through the bearing edge into the shell there is, 
you could really dramatically shorten the sustain too because any energy that is being bled off into the shell is going directly into your hands. So your hands just kind of suck up all that energy, including from the heads. It's because that's where it originates. The stick hits the head, the head vibrates, it goes into the shell. If your, if your hands are sucking it out of the shell, it's also sucking it out of the heads. And when I say rubberized adhesive, because just lately I have removed the wrap from a Ludwig floor tom that I'm refinishing. It's about a mid 80s Ludwig floor tom. The adhesive on it, it adhered really well to the wood, but it was like stretchy, like rubber. And I wound up just rubbing it with my thumbs and kind of rolling it into balls and removing it from the drum shell. And that's how I got it off. Sanding would have been useless because it would have just gummed up the sandpaper. And yet I've seen other adhesives that are extremely hard. So if a cured or dried adhesive is harder than the tone wood of the shell, it may not decrease the drum sustain and could possibly increase it. So if you're adding mass and adhesive for the sake of the plastic wrap that is actually harder than the tone wood, you could wind up actually increasing the sustain of the drum and it would be very much like just adding mass as discussed in the first video. A lot of them though don't do that. And another thing is, is that not all wraps are applied with glue, many are taped. I have here, uh, I don't know why I didn't throw this away, it's been kicking around my garage for about a year, but this is wrap from a, an early 80s Tama Imperial Star, it's a 14 by 10 inch Tom. And if you notice, it came off in one nice sheet. And at the ends of the sheets, you'll see remnants of tape. There's tape there, and on this end, tape here. So this was taped to the drum shell, and it was stretched, I assume, very tightly around the shell, It'd be very, very, very snug, and then another piece of tape then pressed down to adhere it at the seam. Then they drilled holes and applied the hardware, and obviously the hardware is gonna hold the finish on. And a lot of Asian makes, Pearl, um, I don't know specifically if Yamaha did this, but I do know that Tama did it. Although I've also seen some Tama Imperial Star drums that were glued 360 degrees like American drum companies typically did. In a situation like this, it's being held on, and but as the drum shell vibrates, even though it might be snugly tight, it's not really adhered to the shell. And so it's actually creating some friction as the shell vibrates and that friction is bleeding off energy as well. So whether it's through adhesive or whether it's through the lack of adhesive, adding the wrap could very well decrease the vibration of the drums in such a way that it actually affects the sustain of the drum heads as well. I hope that makes sense. By the way, interesting story. My introduction to the concept of drums sounding better without plastic wrap was in the late 80s, like I said. But actually, two decades earlier, someone else had already kind of grasped that concept and ordered a drum kit specifically without plastic wrap for that very same reason. Any guess who that might have been? I did not learn this story until just a few years ago. But Ringo Starr from the Beatles in 1968 ordered his maple colored kit, which he took delivery of, I think, in October of 68 and started using then in early 69 on the, on the Get Back sessions, which became Let It Be, and obviously used it on Abbey Road as well. Earlier in 68, when the Beatles were in India, there was another singer there named Donovan, a Scottish uh, artist, and he was explaining to them that he sanded the finish off of his guitar because it created a much more brighter tone that he thought benefited the guitar. And the Beatles went back and they all started sanding the finish off their guitars. And then they loved the way they sounded. And so Ringo thought, well, maybe that's true for drums too. And so he had always used the you know, plastic wrapped drum. So he ordered a set from Ludwig that had no finish. And it actually did come with a sprayed clear coat finish. And interestingly enough, he did not sand that off, nor did he sand off the white paint that was on the inside, which I think is funny because you have a natural finish and yet the inside's still painted white. That's kind of funny to me, but it didn't have a big strip of plastic glued to the thing. And that no doubt was in his mind an improvement. Also funny to me, he then immediately went to putting tea towels on things and a lot of muffling in the bass drum and taking the front head off and all that kind of stuff. So he wasn't really necessarily going for a vibrant, alive drum sound, but he did get those drums because the idea was that they might sound better without the plastic wrap on them. So that was full 20 years before I learned the concept of that. So just thought I'd throw that out there as an aside. 
So what's the bottom line? Well, wrapping a drum shell with plastic finish adds an insulating layer or a source of friction, which is another kind of insulation if you think about it. It, it stops vibration between the shell and the added mass of the wrap itself, both of which decrease a shell's ability to vibrate, resulting in a stronger fundamental tone, but not necessarily greater sustain. So unlike adding mass, like we talked about in the first video, adding wrap doesn't increase sustain or may not necessarily increase sustain, often does not increase the sustain, but it will increase the fundamental content of the tone. So you wind up with punchy, shorter, deeper sounding drums if they're wrapped versus brighter, punchy, short drums if they're thin shells without wrap. So hopefully that's useful. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Again, this is the third installment. There are more coming. Uh, the first two are linked below, and I'll probably link them actually right here as well. So check those out if you have not, please. If you like this kind of subject matter, this is just one series of videos that I'm doing, but everything that I'm doing on this channel is drum related. Recording drums and the history of drums and drum physics like this. And I'll be auditioning drums. Uh, I've got a drum review coming up soon and lots of other stuff, but drums, drums, drums. If you like drums, uh, please subscribe, like, hit that bell notification so you know when I upload new videos. And I really do appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot. I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.